So that's how tech arranged for me to talk to you, Mr. Donald. You see, I'm taking Automotive Shop and I have to write a report explaining how one of the electrical systems works. I decided the new seat belt warning system would make a good project. The trouble is, I haven't been able to find much information on the subject that explains how the system works. And without even a wiring diagram, I haven't been able to figure it out for myself. You're about to get all the information you need, Ray. What Mr. Donald doesn't know about this seat belt warning system isn't worth knowing. I'll be more than glad to explain how the system works and tell you about a new troubleshooting procedure we've worked out, Ray. For openers, I want to make sure you understand exactly what the belt warning system does. The warning light and buzzer operate when the ignition is on, the torque flight selector is in any gear, and the driver's seat belt is not fastened, or at least extended. This is the sound. On manual transmission cars, the requirements are the same, except that the buzzer and light operate when the parking brake is released, instead of being tied in with a gear selector. Text right. Now, in addition, if someone is sitting in the passenger side of the front seat and the lap belt hasn't been fastened, the warning buzzer and light operate. To be technically correct, a child weighing as little as 47 pounds must operate the passenger seat side of the warning system. Next, let's look at the hardware. The system uses a buzzer, a warning light, a relay, two lap belt retractor switches, and a front passenger seat switch. The circuit is also tied into the neutral safety switch on torque flight cars, the parking brake warning light switch on manual transmission cars. In addition, a diode is required on some models. Wow, it looks like I bit off a pretty good sized project for myself. I, I sure hope you can explain how those parts work in terms I can understand. Well, I'm sure we can, Ray. And for a bonus, we'll explain how to locate the trouble if something goes wrong. This part of the circuit diagram shows the feed part of the buzzer and light circuit. It's a simple series connection from battery through the ignition switch and fuse to the buzzer and warning lamp. As you can see, the buzzer and the lamp are connected in parallel. I'll cover the ground side of the circuit in small bites that will be easy to digest, Ray. The ground side of the buzzer and lamp is connected to the driver's seat belt retractor switch. When the belt isn't extended, the switch is closed, completing the circuit to the ground at the seat belt relay. What does that relay do? The seat belt relay is actually a ground circuit switch. The important thing to remember is that the warning system ground circuit is open when the relay coil is energized. The warning system only works when the relay is not energized and the ground circuit is closed. For example, on a torque flight equipped car, the transmission neutral safety switch is closed when the selector is in park or in neutral. The closed neutral safety switch completes the ground circuit for the relay and with ignition on, the relay is energized and the ground switch is open. I get it. Since there's no ground for the buzzer and light, they don't operate when the selector's in neutral or park. Right. Now, on a manual transmission car, the parking brake warning light switch controls the ground circuit for the seat belt relay. If the parking brake is applied, the buzzer won't buzz and the lamp won't light. On the other hand, with the parking brake released, the ground circuit for the relay coil is open. The relay ground switch is closed and the belt warning system is activated when the ignition is on. And the buzzer tells the driver to fasten his seatbelt. Now I understand how the driver's side of the circuit works. How about the ground control circuit for the passenger side? On the passenger side of the front seat, it takes a seat switch and a belt retractor switch to do the job. The only difference in the passenger side ground circuit is the addition of the seat switch. It's connected in series with a belt retractor switch. The seat switch is normally open. That is, it's open as long as no one is sitting on the passenger side of the front seat cushion. However, when someone sits in the passenger seat, the seat switch closes. If the seat belt isn't pulled out, the passenger belt retractor switch remains closed and the warning signals operate, providing the ignition is on and the torque flight selector is in gear. Since the passenger belt switch is connected in parallel with the driver's belt switch, the warning system can be activated by either seat belt switch. Now I understand those circuits, but I still have a couple of questions. 
how come a seat switch isn't required on the driver's side? And could you explain about those diodes you said were used in the circuits for some models? I'll field that first question, Ray. A seat switch is not required on the driver's side because it can be assumed that the driver's seat will be occupied when the engine is started. Someone better be in the driver's seat when the transmission shifted into gear. You can answer the diode question, Don. On manual transmission cars, the brake master cylinder warning light switch, as well as the parking brake switch, is connected into the ground side of the seat belt relay coil. In other words, there are two potential ways to complete the relay coil ground circuit. As a result, if pressure is lost in one part of the hydraulic system, the master cylinder switch will close. This energizes the relay coil and opens the warning system ground circuit at the relay. As a result, the system would not work. To eliminate this possibility, a diode is inserted into the master cylinder warning switch circuit. Since a diode is a one-way electrical flow valve, either the parking brake switch or the master cylinder switch can complete the brake lamp ground circuit. However, the diode prevents the master cylinder warning switch from completing the ground circuit for the seat belt relay coil. For all practical purposes, the ground circuit is open at the diode. There sure is more to the system than I thought there was. No wonder I couldn't figure it out for myself. A diode is also used on Imperials sold in California, but for a different reason. These models have an electric fuel pump circuit, which could present a feedback condition. The electric fuel pump is connected into the oil pressure warning light switch, so that the pump won't keep pumping when the engine isn't running. This is in itself a safety feature but it introduces a potential seatbelt warning system problem. I don't see the connection. Well, the electric fuel pump circuit provides a possible ground circuit for the seatbelt relay. This could cause the relay to be energized, opening the warning system ground circuit and making the system inoperative. To eliminate this possibility, a diode is used in the electric fuel pump circuit. The diode prevents the fuel pump circuit from providing a ground for the seat belt relay coil. The reasons are different, but the result is the same as for the diode used in manual transmission models. I suppose the belt retractor and seat switches can't be taken apart or repaired, but I would like to know how they work. You suppose correctly, Ray. The belt retractor and switch are serviced only as an assembly. The seat switch is also serviced as an assembly. However, we have a couple of cutaways that show how these switches work. The retractor switch is attached to the belt retractor and operated by rotation of the retractor spool. Inside the retractor switch, this small pinion gear is driven by the retractor spool. As the seat belt is pulled out or extended, the pinion drives the ring gear and cam. In this position, the ring gear and cam have rotated far enough to push the cam follower opening the switch contacts. In case you're interested in technical details, the belt must be pulled out from five to ten inches before the switch is opened and the signals are turned off. This shows how the passenger seat switch is attached to the seat springs. Remember, the switch must be open when the passenger seat is not occupied. That looks like a lot of switch for a simple Siri circuit job. The requirements aren't quite that simple, Ray. The switch must be capable of adjusting the changes in the seat contour as the padding and springs age. It must also have an over-travel feature to accommodate very heavy as well as very light passengers. Here's how that's done. Weight on the seat causes the entire switch to deflect or bend. This bending motion moves a slider inside the switch toward the electrical contacts. The contacts are pushed together, closing this part of the ground circuit. This illustrates how the slider and contacts look from the top. The switch slider has moved rearward and closed the contacts. Notice that the slider is against a built-in stop. It can't move any farther without breaking something. To provide the necessary over-travel needed to accommodate a heavier passenger, a simple clutch connects the slider part of the switch to the flat spring, the part that bends causing the slider movement. When the slider hits the stop, the clutch slips. This provides the necessary over-travel and prevents breakage. When the weight is removed from the seat, 
the spring deflection pushes the switch slider forward until it bottoms in that position. Again, the clutch slips, the contacts are open, and the switch is automatically reset and adjusted to the unloaded seat contour. When a seat switch is installed, it must be cycled or preset before it will operate properly. This is easily accomplished by simply having someone weighing 150 pounds or more sit on the seat. When that someone gets off the seat, the switch will be all set to operate correctly. And now, if someone will turn the record, We'll give you the lowdown on servicing and troubleshooting the seat belt warning system. Because of differences between bucket seats and bench seats and variations in seat firmness, four different passenger seat switches are used. These two with the shorter electrical leads are used on models with bucket seats. The two with longer leads are for bench seat models. In addition, the switches with the black plastic cases are calibrated for a different degree of seat firmness than the ones with the white plastic cases. Because of these differences, when installing a new switch, be sure you order the right part number and make sure the new switch looks exactly like the one it's replacing. Here are a couple of more tips. There is only one correct way to attach the seat switch to the seat cushion springs. A wide piece of tape marks the attachment point for the front switch clip. On some models, rear clip location is also critical, so a narrow piece of tape is used to show you where to attach the rear clip. If the switch clips are attached to the wrong spring loops, the switch may not operate correctly. Worse yet, incorrect attachment could result in breakage of the rear clip. Here's one more tip before Don tells you about troubleshooting the system. Since the seat switch must operate under quite light loads, a heavy object on the passenger side of the front seat may activate the warning system. For example, a heavy parcel, a big briefcase, or even a lady's loaded handbag could close the seat switch contacts. Owners should know that this is normal. That's a good point, Tech. We've worked out a troubleshooting procedure that's just about foolproof. It's based on an eight-step checkout procedure that you can perform in one minute, a little less if you hustle. In case of trouble, this checkout will tell you what's wrong and what to test first. Except for a couple of voltage checks, you can perform all of the required tests with a continuity test light and a test jumper wire. You'll find the complete checkout and troubleshooting procedure in this month's reference book. Don will explain how you use this information. The purpose of the eight-step checkout is to determine the exact conditions under which the system isn't working properly. You simply perform each numbered checkout step until the trouble shows up. Then, turn to the corresponding troubleshooting procedure and follow the recommended test steps until you locate the cause of trouble. For example, if the seat belt warning system doesn't do what it's supposed to do at checkout step number three, turn to troubleshooting procedure three. Perform each test until you uncover the exact cause of the trouble together with the recommended correction. Get into the car, Ray, and I'll tell you how to run through the complete checkout procedure. For checkout step one, the torque flight selector must be in neutral. Close the door to keep the ignition key buzzer quiet. Turn the ignition on, but don't start the engine. The buzzer and light should remain off. Checkout step two tests the buzzer and warning light. With ignition still on, move the torque flight selector lever into reverse or any forward drive gear. The light should come on and the buzzer should sound. Check out step three, test the driver's seat belt retractor circuit. Pull the lap belt out of its retractor at least 10 inches. This should turn the light and buzzer off. Step four checks the passenger seat and retractor circuit. With the driver's belt still extended, slide over to the passenger side of the seat. The buzzer and light should come on. To test the right front lap belt retractor switch, pull the passenger belt out of its retractor at least 10 inches while holding the driver's belt extended. This should turn the buzzer and light off. Next, release the right front lap belt, making sure that it retracts all of the way. Keep the driver's belt extended. The buzzer and light should come on. 
Release both belts and then turn the ignition off. The buzzer and light should go off. Double check the circuit by turning the ignition on to make sure the buzzer and light come on again. For the final check, put the selector in park. The buzzer and light should go off. Actually, check out steps seven and eight are precautionary safety checks, and if something is wrong, you'll find out what the problem is before you get to step seven. It sure didn't take long to check this warning system out, but suppose it had flunked check out step number one, and the buzzer and light had come on when they should have remained off. How would I locate the trouble? You'd follow troubleshooting procedure number one, Ray. The first test step is obvious. If the car starts in neutral and park, the neutral safety switch is okay. It is closing and providing a ground circuit for the seat belt relay coil and opening the warning system ground circuit. To test the relay circuit, remove the relay connector. If the buzzer and light go off, the trouble is in the relay or in the relay operating circuits. To check out the relay circuits, Connect a continuity light between the brown wire ground terminal of the connector and the blue wire feed terminal. If the test light comes on, the circuits are complete and the trouble is in the relay. If the light does not come on or is very dim, test the ground side of the relay circuit by connecting the test light between the brown wire terminal and battery positive. To test the feed side, connect the test light between the blue wire terminal and battery ground. This will tell you whether the trouble is in the ground circuit for the relay or in the relay feed circuit. If when the connector is removed from the relay, the buzzer and lights stay on, there is a short in the warning system ground circuit. The next step is to find out whether the short is in the instrument panel wiring harness or the body harness. To do this, disconnect the warning system ground circuit connector, which is located in the side cowl. If the buzzer and light remain on, the dark blue wire in the instrument panel harness is shorted. On the other hand, if the buzzer and light go off when the circuit is opened at the cowl connector, the short is in the body wiring harness, one of the seat retractor switches, or the seat switch. You can use the test light to check for a ground short in the seat retractor switches. Simply connect the light from battery positive to one of the retractor switch terminals. The test light should not come on. This wiring diagram gives all the color codes for the wires. It also shows the location of the various wiring harness connectors. This will help you track down wiring harness shorts. Now just to make sure you understand how our troubleshooting procedure works, I'll explain one more test procedure. If in checkout step two, the warning light and buzzer both had stayed off when they should have come on. The trouble could be in the neutral safety switch, the fuse, the driver's belt retractor switch, the seat belt relay, or an open circuit in the wiring. That's a lot of could be's. To track down the exact cause, follow troubleshooting procedure number two, starting with the neutral safety switch. If, with a selector in reverse or any forward gear, the car does not start, the neutral safety switch is okay, and there is no short in the wire that connects it to the relay. Next, make sure the fuse is okay. You can do this by turning the ignition on and applying the parking brake. If the brake warning light does come on, the fuse is not blown. That's because on all models, the seatbelt warning system and the brake light share the same fuse. Good point, Tech. Step three checks the driver's belt retractor switch to make sure the contacts are closed when the belt is retracted. You can do this by connecting a hot lead to one switch terminal and the continuity test light as a ground jumper to the other switch terminal. The test light should light. To test the seat belt relay, remove the connector and use a jumper to ground the gray wire terminal of the relay connector. If the buzzer and light come on, the relay is not properly grounded or it is not working and should be replaced. 
If you haven't located the trouble up to this point, you'll have to check for a loose connector or an open circuit somewhere in the wiring harness. The logical way to go about this is to find out whether the open circuit is in the instrument panel wiring harness or the body harness. I hate to sound the warning buzzer on this session, Don, but we've run out of time. I certainly am much obliged to you, Mr. Donald, for the time you've taken to explain the seatbelt warning system. You're more than welcome, Ray. Here is a copy of this month's reference book so you can study the remaining test procedures. We've put a very complete explanation of the seatbelt warning system in the reference book. It also contains the complete checkout and troubleshooting procedure for both manual and torque flight models.